Hey there, and welcome to the Unleash Your Greatness Within podcast. In today's success interview, it was my privilege to interview Antonio Nieto Rodriguez. And let me tell you something, it was a powerful interview. My passion and my mission to help you unleash your greatness within. My heart goes out to the underdogs, that, that's on our way. If you think you can, go from good to great. Okay, let's motivate. Greatnesswithin.com. You see, Antonio is the author of this new book by Harvard Business Review Project Management Handbook. The subtitle or title is How to Launch, Lead, and Sponsor Successful Projects. And you know what? I read the book. If you're a leader, if you're a manager, uh, listen, if you want to get more things done and inspire your people along the way, you want to become a believer in uh, project management and putting groups together that create projects and fulfill them. But let me just give you a little bit of the background of Antonio because he's got a stellar record. Antonio is the author, practitioner, professional, and advisor who teaches strategy and project implementation to senior leaders and managers. He has held leadership positions at PricewaterhouseCoopers and also GlaxoSmithKline. His research has been recognized by Thinkers50 with its prestigious, quote, ideas and practice, unquote, award. And he is featured in the 2020 Global Guru's Top 30 list of management professionals. Wow. Uh, let me tell you, he just has a lot here that uh, I won't take the time to read, but I will say this. He's the author of three bo other books titled The Project Revolution, Lead Successful Projects, and The Focused Organization. And he's also contributed to many articles. But let me tell you something. What a great book in terms of leading your organization from a project management uh, perspective, and he gives a lot of research behind it and also experiences and stories around it. But let me tell you, this interview that we had, we dove deep into it, tried to keep it inspirational and so forth. He agreed in the beginning, you'll see it, uh, that sometimes project management can be a boring concept, but you know what? We try to breathe life into it. And so, listen, the whole interview was just powerful. Antonio was a great guest to have on the show, very kind. And let me just say that if you're watching this on my YouTube channel, hey, do me a favor, subscribe, and make sure you click that notification bell so that you'll be the first to be notified when I come out with a new success interview and also a motivational message, if you will. And if you have downloaded this from iTunes, thank you. If you're not part of my community, I invite you to be a part of my community, whether it be on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Play, or of course, iTunes or Apple Podcasts. I would love to have you a part of my community and make sure you check out Greatness Within com and find out how we can help you and your organization thrive. All right, let's jump right into the interview with Antonio Nieto Rodriguez. Antonio, welcome to the Unleash Your Greatness Within podcast. Thank you, TJ. It's a pleasure to be here in your show. I love your podcast. I love what you're doing for sharing uh, knowledge and best practice. So it's really an honor to be here with you today. Uh, and discuss around my new book. Uh, hey, I got your new book here, and I got to tell you, it's an honor to have you on the show as well. I appreciate your comments, but literally, you have a lot of uh, insights in this book. And as I looked over your uh, biography and so forth, wow, you have a lot of accolades behind your name, but just keeping it real for us. Hey, why don't you do me and our audience a favor? Would you mind just giving us some of your backstory, your history, that'd be great. Sure, TJ. So from more a personal perspective, my life has been about traveling around the world. I didn't have even a say when my parents decided to move from Spain, Madrid to Mexico. Then from Mexico, we lived in Rome, in Italy. 
And then in the Netherlands, in the US. So I've been kind of a grown wow. as a global citizen. So I'm from Madrid, from Spain, but I always thought I belonged more outside Spain. So I'm, I'm truly, uh, I believe, very global. I like lo- global issues. I like to connect with people around the world. So that's kind of me personally. On the professional side, TJ, I was a terrible student. I I just didn't get the stuff at high school. It was too complicated. I got bored. My, my mind was wandering all over the place during the class. And, and, and things changed when I went for an MBA. Uh, I went to an MBA in London Business School. And the first class was, wow, this was an eye opener. The teacher was playing with my mind. The, yeah. the, the teacher got me 60 minutes paying attention, focus, which had never been before the case in high school, in university, where you had to study a book by memory, by heart. And then, and so I found a new way to teach that I had never experienced in my life. And I said, well, my topic is project management, which is super boring. You know, it's, <laughs> if you go to a week in project management, it's, ah, oh, you just get sleeping. And it, it was, yeah. the, that's 20 years ago. I said, well, I want to teach project management for people who, engage them to to explain them things that they need for their job yeah. as executives uh, as managers but in an interesting way with case studies with a simple tool so that's kind of the starting point about 20 years ago where my life changed into well i want to teach people but in a different way i love that and i love that you're that personal i i feel like Right now, in this moment, I, we have some similarities. I also struggled in school. It was difficult. Mm-hmm. And for whatever reason, it wasn't until I was in my early 20s that that light bulb just went off and I figured out how to study, yeah. how to read. Hey, Antonio, I didn't even read my first book until I was a junior in high school. I mean, wow. <laughs> it's just, but what, what I, the reason I bring that up is, you know, on the Unleash Your Greatness Within podcast. And mm-hmm. I just think it's amazing the number of people that I have interviewed over the years, not all of them, but many mm-hmm. of them have a similar story where that kind of light bulb moment went off a little bit later in life. And thank you for sharing that. I think that's really powerful, I, you know? Sure. I think it, I think it gives people hope that, because I can't think of the hundreds, thousand of speeches that I've given over the years, Mm -hmm. Mm. slowed down recently because of the pandemic, but, but over the years, and I think how many people have come up to me and say, I still haven't figured out, you know, what I want to do. I still haven't figured out right. Different things about my life. And to think that, it doesn't matter where you start. It matters where you finish. And at some point when you got your master's degree or whatever it was, it just kind of clicked, got yeah. kind of clicked for you. So let's talk about project <laughs> management because you say in the book, let me just read it. So I'm accurate. Yeah. You say, quote, projects are routinely marginalized throughout the corporate world. One executive told me, if you want to make sure something is not done, make it a project. Exactly. (laughs) So give us us an overview because I think the listeners are going to go, okay, we got a lot of entrepreneurs. We got a lot of business owners. We got leaders inside companies and so forth that I think will gravitate toward this message today because they do already have projects going on. Mm -hmm. So start kind of given us a picture of what pr- maybe projects used to be, what they are today, where they'll be in the future. So kind of kind of take the lead here, if you would. Sure. Okay, TJ, with pleasure. Uh, I've been working in projects for 25 years. And, and in, in my, my realization, TJ, is that we all do projects. All your listeners, all your listeners are doing projects. There's no doubt. Yeah. Very few have learned how to do projects because project management has been very niche, has been more for the engineers or, or the IT people who very quickly move into agile because project management didn't evolve very fast. It was all about structure, discipline, uh, control. And, and this was maybe great. I, I, I talk about every 20 years, there's a shift in, in new type of projects and technologies. 
but the methods to implement that they're not aligned. It happened in the 60s, in the 80s with SAP, AORP implementations. We didn't have the tools to manage those projects and they were all a mess. There were all massive delays, the ERP implementations. Then in the 2000s, we had all the internet and e-commerce and we were not prepared. We didn't have the tools because they were not ready. And Agile came to the picture to facilitate, to liberate us from project management. And now we're in that stage where we're trying to use Agile and project management for big data projects, for, for digital transformation. And we keep failing because we don't have the right tools. They've not evolved. So what I'm proposing with the HVR book is a different approach, an approach that will suit with any kind of transformation, big data, artificial intelligence, putting the fundamentals in place. I really wanted to give the listeners, the users, something very simple. One thing I'm very much inspired from, TJ, um, I don't know if you came across the business model canvas from Alex Osterwald and Yves Pignon, very famous when you're discussing business models. I read about that in your, uh, you slightly talked about that in your book. Okay, so keep going. Yeah, correct. So maybe you've heard about that. They they've sold like five million. Not so because they give the canvas away. But if you can do a canvas, which is a one pager where you have all the elements of your business, you can discuss it with your management team, with anybody, because you will un understand straight away the elements. I said, I'll do the same for projects. So we can all play the same game with one page. One page, we can discuss about the project fundamentals. If you miss half of them, don't start the project. Don't even start. Most of the projects are ill from the beginning, TJ. We miss some of the fundamentals. Either we launch a digital transformation, but why do we do it? Just because everybody's doing it, right? Why would you not do a digital transformation? So I'm, I'm trying to help the users to say, well, what's the purpose? What do we want to achieve with this project? So basic elements that if you cover them right, you will be able to deliver your projects much better. So that's kind of my mission with the book, TJ, not the professional project managers. Yes, I want to tell them to speak a bit more business language, but I'm interested in the senior leaders who don't know their role, their crucial role as sponsors, their crucial role as selecting projects. Which project do we do? Which project? We all love to start projects, but which one is the right one, right? So how can you select and prioritize the best projects? How can you push transformation through the organization to be more successful. That's a bit the big picture of the concepts that I'm trying to bring TJ to the table. Okay, no, that's great. That's a good big picture. So yesterday I was on an executive coaching call. I do a lot of those. Anyway, executive mm -hmm. coaching call. And it was with a mid-level manager. And the mid-level manager said, Leadership came down and gave us 34 projects for my team. So that leads me to the concept of let's define a project. Because in my conversation with this person, is that, is that more of a task? Because he felt overwhelmed. 34 projects with eight of us, I just that just doesn't seem possible. And, and the leadership was calling it a project when maybe it was more of a task that needed to be done. I, I don't know. What, do, do you have any thoughts around defining what a project is and what it's not? Sure. And I think you're touching up a, a critical point. And, and your case from yesterday, TJ, I've seen so often, I see companies that have more projects than employees and they still need to run the business. How can you cope with that? So yeah. that's because first, you don't have a clear definition of projects. Projects, I think um, the risky part is if you apply the theoretical definition of a project to your project, mm -hmm. everything that has a start and an end, has some objectives, dedicates resources, that's fine. But I think we need to use projects smarter. Pro projects have a cost. So where do you want to put your bets in terms of your time, your executive time? And then the little ones, the ones I always say below 100 Mondays, and don't call them a project. They're just going to cut, scatter all your, your vision. Focus on the top 10. If you have top 10 projects, those are the ones that you want to get the best people. You want to drive them to execution. The smaller ones, just do them in business as usual. Do them day to day. Don't call them projects because people feel overwhelmed, like the managers you were talking. And that creates a lot of confusion and overwhelming the organization. So just focus on the top 10. 
top 20. Those are the projects that bring the future to your organization. Focus on them. The others, I call them tasks, mini projects, small assignments, business operations improvement, but don't make the distinction, depending on your business, of course, but set the bar somewhere. So usually 80% of the projects that you have in your portfolio, you can do them differently, just day to day and focus on the 20%. Ooh, I love that. Okay, so I want to just kind of tag on that a little bit. 80 the 80 20. Um so we have the things that we have to do day in and day out to keep the business going. Jim Collins calls it the flywheel. Let's just call it the flywheel, right? Yeah. And so yeah. we have this help me see the picture. Are you saying we keep the 80% the flywheel whatever uh, the right term is for you? Um, going, and then the twenty percent are these extra projects that lead us into the future. Is that is or future this way? I guess um, <laughs> is 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 uh, is that what we're talking about? About twenty percent, or are you saying eighty percent should be? Because when I'm reading your book, I'm thinking, wow, it's becoming more and more of a project management culture. So, am I seeing eighty percent? of these projects out there working as you know in groups throughout the organization or is it 20% out there working on these extra projects uh, it's great question again tj because you're going to the difficult area so oh. you yeah my my vision my vision um, what i think is yes 20% is where you need to focus but indeed in my book i'm talking about the big disruption which is we're moving from a world which is driven by efficiency this is a world for the past 80 years from Henry Ford and Taylor and specialization and Correct. hierarchies. Yeah. And, and, and where the focus was, how can we do things faster, cheaper and bigger? Um, and that has been 18 years. We had improvements. And so our operational part in the business has been, um, we're more efficient today than 20 years ago, but that means you need less people also there. Uh, and with artificial intelligence and automation, that piece of operations shrinks completely. So what happens with the resources, with the type of work? It all moves to that space which I call projects. And it's small agile teams. It can be uh, change management initiatives. So what I think is the future of work is project-based. And again, very broad. It's agile teams. It's self-managed teams because we don't need people in operations. In fact, I'm writing, I say it in the book that we don't don't need CEOs anymore. Chief operating officer is the job that you need, you need to run. We don't need them. Where's, where are the operations? Our machines. So that's creating a new CEO or CEO, which is what I call the chief transformation officer who monitors and oversees all the change initiatives in the organization. So that's a very big challenge for leaders. How do I manage my operations while the grow in change is happening all the time where we have more projects? And that's where I think you need to be very focused. That's where you need to say, as a leader, these are our big bets. That's where I want the best people. The rest, just manage your, yourself. Okay. Hope it makes sense. No, no, no. I just, wow. Um, you're a lot smarter than me. So, <laughs> oh, no, no, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm just trying to visually see it. So, if there's a company, let's say they've been in business for 60 years. Mm hmm. And they already have process and procedures nailed down pretty well. Are you turning the existing flow of business into individual projects or do we just continue with those and then set up new projects that help evolve the company into the future so that they're successful and they stay, stay vibrant, if you will, we're not going through and changing all the processes back here. Cause I'm thinking yeah. what, what is triggering no. me? Okay, go ahead. What are your, what are your thoughts first? No, exactly first. what you're saying. We need to keep the machine running. There's no doubt. You need less people for sure. As soon as you put artificial intelligence and robots, you don't need people to touch this, the operations. So what you're saying is right. Now we need more people into innovation, entrepreneurship. We need the ah. people who were running the business to be more creative, bring the next ideas. One of the big disruptions also for people in my world, project managers, mm -hmm. we're not used to bring revenues. Who brings the revenues in a company are the salespeople, the operations where you produce. But now we're saying that's been automated. We don't need you guys. So project people need to de deliver 
of revenues. Don't bring me projects that will deliver something in six years. Who cares what's going to happen in six years? We want revenues in six months, okay? Yeah, right. And that's the projects that we need to think about. We did that with the COVID. So what happened when the pandemic just exploded is we were extremely focused in projects, just two projects, want to keep the company alive, want to transform it so that we can keep growing. That, that's it. We cut 80% of the projects in every organization. Just focus on bringing revenues right now so that we survive. And let's think about the future. What's the project for the big next big thing? And that's what I think companies should keep doing right now when we're just going over. Focus on that. How can we bring revenues from projects to the operations? That's the easy part. Wow. Yeah. That, yeah. With this whole pa COVID pandemic, I, I, I see what you're saying. It has probably caused a lot of companies to pivot differently. They went back to their core. Exactly. And then figured out, okay, how do we move forward? And maybe some new projects were set up. So let me ask you this, Apple computer. When I was reading your book, I had this thought and I want you to correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm, if mm -hmm. I'm seeing this wrong, but I think this is what you're talking. So Apple has a vision um, around technology and the arts and so forth. So for many years, they were computer driven. So when Steve Jobs came back in and stood up on stage with an iPod, would you consider that a new project? and then the iPhone, and then the iPad, and then the uh, iWatch? Or would you, from a visual standpoint, would you view all those as separate projects within the scope and the vision of the, of the company? Absolutely, TJ. I, I, I talk in my book about three types of projects, which comes from um, uh, Kleisens, uh, the, the professor, who talks about innovation, one, there's transformative projects. That's exactly what you were talking about, the next big thing. It's the iPhone, it's the, uh, the iTunes and so on. Then you have uh, sustaining projects, which is growing your core, growing part of your, and then you have efficiency project, which is trying to get better at what you do on, on a daily basis. So for me, the big, the big bets are the transformative. What are the one or two big projects that are going to bring your revenues in three years, in five years? Your current projects will, current operations will, will not deliver that because currently the, the globalization goes so fast that you have a competitor in six months. Oh, yeah. So what are these transformative projects? And, and I love the reference to Steve Jobs because I, I've seen with the launch of the iPhone, one of the best practices that I want to share with the audience, what Steve Jobs did is we are really uh, successful uh, with the iTunes and the iPod. So it's not the right time for us to launch the, the iPhone. It was uh, discussed in 2001. They only launched the project in 2004 and say, mm -hmm. well, we need to focus on our priorities. iPhone is not the priority right now. We can build some knowledge. We can develop some kind of prototypes, but the project will only start when I think is the right timing for it. Most of the companies have an idea and tomorrow you have a kickoff. Right, TJ, companies love kickoff. I don't know your experience, but you, you call a kickoff about a new project, everybody shows up, even the CEO who shows up in the second meeting when you're trying to allocate work and half of the people, right? Yeah, you know totally. <laughs> yeah, totally. Because, yes, for sure. So, one of the things that we, okay, a couple thoughts in my mind. Number one, yeah. how does this apply to the traditional, um, Six Sigma, lean mm. thinking, and so forth. As I was reading your book, you kind of put that in the 1990s and before, and then we start to move toward today, agile, visionary. This is where we're moving in the, in, in the future. Sorry, I'm getting my hands the wrong way. Yeah. <laughs> but but, but um, in terms of efficiency, these projects would still apply some of these principles in the lean, let's say lean thinking or Six Sigma and so forth, yeah. right? No, uh, absolutely. One of the biggest mistakes I think that 
thinkers and academic and uh, made in the past is we always had these battles between methodologies. It's either Six Sigma or project management. Yeah. This was the 60s, the 70s. Yeah. One or the other, you need to choose because one is the right one, the other one is bad and all. That happened with project management in Agile where Agile completely said, we don't want project management. I, I don't even need project managers. I don't use that term. And, and that was wrong, but that stayed that kind of polarization in terms of methods between projects and Agile was there for 20 years. And what I'm saying, embrace everything. Agile is great. Project management is great, but also Six Sigma and, and Lean Startup and design thinking, because today the world of change is so big that we need all these tools. I always say, well, with project management, you have a hammer to fix all the problems at home. Mm -hmm. With Agile, you have a screwdriver mm -hmm. to fix all the problems. This is so wrong. We need a hammer, a screwdriver, and anything yes. what you can build in terms of tools and competencies to deliver change today. And that's that's a big mistake. I'm part of those mistakes. I can recognize I was pushing for project management. It's wrong. It's completely wrong. It's everything. I got it. Okay, good. So, um, you know, we have what we call a leadership academy that we take into mm. companies. And one of the things that we do, and we stumbled on this because of a CEO of a company had this idea and so for a few years now, we've been doing this where we will take 30 to 40 people through a six-month leadership course called the Leadership Academy. But as part of that, we divide the group up into six groups. And what we do is we have them team, we actually team them up into groups, six different groups, and we call it a CFT, cross-functional team, where mm -hmm. they are then given a a big goal to improve something or to create something. And then for six months, as part of the training, they work outside of the training as a team to come up with the problem, the weaknesses, the opportunities, the solutions, the countermeasures, and so forth. And then they present at the end of the six months, all their findings in a matter of 15 minutes to the executive team. And then the executive team can decide which one of those, based on timing, which one of those um, we should move on quickly versus maybe put one on a back burner for now and so forth. I'm thinking, based on that description, that those CFT groups and what they're focused on to improve something would be putting a group of people into a in, into a project management group. Is that fair? Yeah. Absolutely. And, and I love what you're doing in the academy in leadership. I think that's every organization, small, medium, large, should do what you're doing. It's, it's, I've seen it in practice. I've also recommended, I've worked with um, big corporations uh, where the CEO was saying to the 12 uh, executives by P, BP, each of you, I want just one project. I want that you come up with one yes. project Yes. that you're going to deliver in the next two years, that's going to bring me 100 million Swiss francs. You also do. I want 1 billion Swiss franc extra revenues in two years. So the, that put the pressure on this. I'll give you resources. We work on cross-functional teams, uh, but I think that's what every CEO should be doing with their management, senior level. Uh, bring me one project that will deliver X time of money in X time. That's how you create growth. All, out of these pro 12 projects that we did together, they started to face some of these cross-functional issues because they were asking resources from other division. Yeah. They said, what's in it for me? If this guy wins, then how I do get... So we needed to change a bit the compensation. We needed to, uh, to make people... I have my job description. What the... <laughs> job descriptions are so old. Why do we still use it but they were using job descriptions right so it doesn't fit it doesn't say my job description i need to work in this project strategic come on so we had to change job descriptions uh compensation prioritization of the time of the individuals but what happened in the end of these 12 strategic projects seven succeeded five failed that's okay but the seven brought more than one billion Swiss francs in two years. So I think we, we gave them training on, on senior executive uh, project management and so on. We build the competence. But I think that's what the CEO should be doing today is what you're doing in your leadership academy is give me one project, just one, the one that's going to bring us 
100 million in the next two years. And I'll support you. I'll put you the, the, the resources. I'll be there committed to support you. I love what you're doing. Well, it's yeah, yeah, because um, yeah. So the, the 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 I don't know if this is the the subtitle or the title, but how to launch, lead, and sponsor successful projects. Well, even before reading the book, one of the insights that we came up with was to put every executive in this. So these are mid-level employees, mm -hmm. but we have a sponsor that's on the executive team that's responsible for every CFT group. Now, keep in mind, these mm -hmm. people of the seven people in the group, eight people in the group that are working as a new team, Mm -hmm. they still have their day job that they, that they're exactly. doing, right. So, mm -hmm. so when we create these extra tools, they are awe inspiring, right? You work with a new group of people, you're learning things that you didn't know. It's kind of like a subtle way of job shadowing because now you're starting mm -hmm. to see how this might affect your department that you never saw before until you started to work with someone from this department, right? There's exactly. all these cool little things that happen in this process, but in the end, I'm hearing you say, you, and I read it in the book, usually up, and correct me if I'm wrong, usually a project is something that hasn't been done before. And it probably has a revenue aspect tied to it. Is there anything I'm missing there or, or should I correct? Exactly. Anything? You have great memory, TJ. That's <laughs> it. And Great memory. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed. But yes, exactly. It has. It, if, if you've done it before, then yeah, it might be more an efficiency project. But you don't. Need, it's not a big bet. The big bets are the things that you're completely unaware. You've never done, and you want to make money out of it, right? So, so the question is, um, not to put you on the spot here, but <laughs> it has to do with risk. When I read. Um, Jim Collins's book, How the Mighty Fall, he basically said in the book that when he used the example in the book, Good to Great, right? Mm. He used the example of Circuit City. But in the next book, How the Mighty Fall, he talked about how Circuit City forgot to focus on what made him successful in the beginning. They started to focus on all these new technologies, mm. forgetting mm. what they did in the beginning. How do you manage the risk level between, let's say, optimism or risk tolerance mm -hmm. versus analyzing the pitfalls and cautiousness? I mean, what are some thoughts around all that? I think it's a great point. And I've seen companies going completely busted uh, because they took too much risk. I was in a big bank, French bank, Belgian bank at the time, which took too many risks in the in the financial crisis, we bought a huge company in the Netherlands, uh, ABN Ambro, huge bank, but we were also playing in the subprime and, and the whole thing collapsed. It went busted in like a week. So that was taking too much risk, was forget about your core and just put all the bets on, on the roulette and that didn't work out. So absolutely, I think I, I think Google is the one that I read is they have like on their projects, they have 50%, 60% on, on their core. Let's get better. Let's be more efficient. Let's automate if we can. Let's know our customer better, service them better. Then you have about 30, 20% on next generation products. So what's the next, <coughs> sorry, the next iWatch, the next whatever with new features and better. And then you have the big bets, which is about 10, 20%. This, if you look at venture capital as well, they, that's uh -huh. how, how they spread the risk. I think that's how you need to look at projects as well. Spreading the risk is absolutely key. Very few companies look at that like this. They launch projects and, oh, it makes sense. It's aligned with more strategy, but nobody really looks at risk. So I, I love your point on, on thinking from a risk management perspective. How much risk can we cope? And, and if we're already doing 20% of our budget in highly risk projects, don't launch them. One, one thing I always say to leaders, I have so many projects. I say, never start a new project if you don't finish or cancel two, because then ah. if you reduce the risk, and you reduce the resources that you can put. So always think about risk. Absolutely. When you're making decisions about the next projects. Absolutely. Great point. Thanks Good. for bringing it. Oh, for sure. So on page um, 69, I love this. You know, you said it in the beginning. 
the concept of simplify it on one page, a canvas. And yes. I tell you, the outline of canvas parts, you say, and, and so talk about it, but you say first the, there's the foundation that involves purpose, investment, and benefits. You then have the people domain, sponsorships, shareholders, and resources. And then you have the creation domain, which is the deliverables, the plan, and the change. What I love about that is that it is so simple. And my thought is, if it's not simple, oftentimes it won't get finished, right? If it's not simple and easy to digest and easy to get inspired about, exactly. then you run a risk of it not ever coming into fruition. Any thoughts? Well, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and one thing that as an expert in projects and project management, one thing that upsets me, and, and I, when, every time I talk to the community of professionals, I say there's very few professions that has such appalling success rate where uh, just 20% of the projects succeed. Whatever you look at, 20, 30%, I think, how is that possible? How can we continuously perform so poorly over the last 40 years? We have great new methodologies. We have a lot of people certifying, but we still fail. So what I think is one of the big elements is that People don't have the same understanding of what is a project, what are the fundamentals, and then you go on like you were saying and, and, and then becomes a mess. Nobody really understands what we're doing. So my goal was hyper simplify the key concepts. Yes. And that's how I came with the canvas, the nine building blocks. And one of the ones I love and with very few people have been talking in the world of projects is the purpose of your project. I think benefits is great. Investment, cost benefit, return on investment. That part we know, we tend to be over optimistic. That's clear. Nobody has ever seen a bad business case. They all look great and sexy, right? <laughs> Otherwise there would not be a business case. Right. But then I think nobody cares about the business case. It's the executive. But if I'm going to work in a project that makes 20% ROE or 30, I don't care. My team doesn't care. They want to make change. They want to work on something that's meaningful. So the, the why of your project, the why, what do you want to really achieve? And I talk about this example recently an HBR post on that is purpose is sometimes more in, much more engaging than, than a business case. And I talk about somebody who's working on an HR system, a new HR system is a project manager I know. And I say, I ask her, what, what is the project about? We're replacing an old HR system. I say, but why? Because um, this new system has extra functionality, which is building communities and our staff is not happy. So we want to engage them more so that they don't leave and we keep them happy. Ah, so that's the system about. And why do you want to keep employees happy? I ask her. And she says, because if they're happy, we would perform better. Our company will engage more talent. So I say, well, did you see that, Susan? We're moving from an HR system, which is what you told me, to a something that is going to create more engaging employees and a happier. So that's what makes a huge difference. Everybody wants to work on a project who's make, going to make your company better. Nobody wants to work in an HR system. Oh, I love that. I, for years, I've been teaching teams and organizations to get to that why, to get to that purpose long right. before Sinet came yeah. out with his book. I mean, I've been in this business for like you a long time. And, uh, <laughs> But I, I will say, I would always tell, like if I was working with an electric company, right? I'd say, you're not in the electric business. You're in the business of helping functionality and, and keeping houses warm, right? Okay. If I'm working in a transportation company, bus drivers, for example, we took a whole team of bus drivers through our training many years ago, the whole organization. It was a city bus organization. And I said, you guys aren't technically in the transportation business. And I was having fun with it, right? Technically, yeah. you're in the connecting friends and families business, right? I love it. Right? Those, it's getting teams and great leaders have a way of doing this, taking what may be boring or mundane and mm -hmm. breathing what I would say, breathing life into it by helping mm -hmm. people see the deeper vision behind it. And I think a, a good, 
I think a good leader, if they're going to have people work on these projects, has to help, or maybe it's the project leader, has to help the team they're working with really catch that vision. Otherwise, it could die on the vine. Any thoughts around that? Absolutely. It's something that uh, you will need to uh, expect much more today where people are a bit tired of change, are a bit tired of uncertainty. I think when I was talking about this bigger uh, shift between a world driven by efficiency where, yeah, we had some kind of stability where you had job descriptions that would tell you, well, this is what you need. This is your box. Yes. Don't move from the box. Just do what's in the box and do it right. And then in three years, that's where you can get. That's gone. That's gone. That There is no job descriptions. Nobody knows what's going to happen in six months. People are tired of change, but that's the reality. So it brings the purpose and, and that emotional heart much more into play where people need to be inspired and motivated through different ways. And what you're doing, TJ, I, I love it even before Simon Sinek. So that's great is focusing on that. You're not here in this business for that. You're, you're going beyond that and, and think about that. And I think that's great leadership. And that's what any senior leader, project manager, I'm pushing them to think more about that way is not so much management anymore. It's more about leadership that helps us navigate through this um, change that we're not used to and is not going to go back to the past. So we better embrace it. I love it. I love it. I love it because I feel like over since 1997 is when I got into the business of working with mm. people, personal development, writing books around it and so forth. When I wrote the book, The Secret of the Slight Edge with a man by the name of Bob Mowad, who was a great leader in the personal development space. He was, he was one of the early teachers of the people side of the business. When working with a lot of government organizations and so forth, it was all about, like you said, efficiency and, and trying to get, you know, just a little bit more effective, which we want to do. We're not saying that's not effective, but moving people to this why, moving people to this purpose, you're going to get much, you're going to get more heart rather than sometimes I call it reluctant compliance, mm. right? Where you get the yeah. bare minimum. And the key yeah. is get people's heart involved and they will give you more than what they're paid for. Would you agree? Mm. Would you agree with that? I, I agree completely. I love what you uh, write about. I, I not just the secret of the slidey edge, but the, the thing you can uh, part as well, it's, it's so important if you think you can. Uh, it's great. I think it's where we need to move. And what's interesting is we always thought that the leaders don't need this. They, they are <laughs> ahead. Um, <laughs> yeah. And it's more for employees. Let's teach them how to manage projects. Let's teach let's, let's them True. how to cope yeah. with change. And I think we're in a stage where leaders are not ready. Leaders are the ones that need to be trained and coach and mentor to go through this phase, the leaders love routine. That's what you can measure. That's how your, your stock market pay it goes. It's through routine, it's through operations or stability. So I think the, the big change here is that we really need to train leaders. That's why you were saying this is the subtitle of your book. Yes, because I think leaders, and according to several research I've done with HBR and LinkedIn, for example, they're not prepared. So I, I think you're right in focusing on executives to bring them the new tools and competencies to thrive in this more, um, yeah. Um, well, 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 is, well, think about it this way, uh, just for the audience's sake, I have found, and I'm curious to see if you found the same thing, because you've been in the business a long time too, of seeing people perform. And that is, if I train the whole organization of frontline workers on a particular thing that gets them excited, gets them engaged, right? They look at their job in a new way, but I don't take leadership through the same principles and ideas and concepts. It just seems like it will never um, take hold within the culture of the company unless leadership shares that vision. As every, It has to go from... Um, has to impact one end to the other end. And if it doesn't, then you run the risk of wasted money, lower nice. performance, because mm -hmm. the next time a leader, one of the things we teach is, is defy the status quo with dignity. So with respect. Right. 
and, yeah. and, and, yeah. and right. Let's be respectful about it, but let's mm-hmm. defy what maybe could be done better or a little bit differently and so forth and speak up and mm-hmm. share that and create an environment where that's okay to mm-hmm. voice thoughts and ideas that can help the company succeed. But if the leaders aren't getting that message, it only takes one or two times for these frontline workers to push back mm-hmm. on something before they're kind of shoved back down and told them not to worry about something. Right. Yeah. So yeah. the key is getting everybody involved in these concepts. And I do think that it starts with the leaders. Um, Ken Blanchard, yeah. he was on my podcast a couple of years ago. Ken, Ken Blanchard said, remember this, TJ? He said, leadership is mirrored throughout the organization. It, start, it starts with the leadership. And so we got to get that it's right. Strong. I love that. And you actually talk about that in the book. Getting yeah. leaders behind these concepts will make a huge huge difference exactly yeah no i i completely agree and and i think that's where you can see the the big companies the success of companies then from the others and i think there's the concept of psychological safety from amy edmondson which is what you need to create people need to feel uh, yes. every opinion counts every uh, uh, you can be wrong and and i think if you're not able to tell the truth about your organization what needs to be changed you're lying to yourself this is not going to take you very far and and i completely agree with what you're saying is getting everybody involved everybody wants to be in the boat but invite them let them play a role i i, I think this is the new role of leadership that we need to uh, preach and, and teach and hopefully convince the people. Agreed. Agreed. And I think you articulate that in the book so well, just the mm-hmm. idea that keep it simple, have some projects that you put together that just um, give sort of that edge to the company. You're always thinking ahead. Mm-hmm. Um while maintaining efficiency over here, you want to make sure that you're building for the future. And what you do in the book, I thought was really powerful is, listen, we've only scratched the surface in yes. this interview, because as I was reading the book, I just thought, wow, there is so much you get into how projects used to be in the past, mm-hmm. what they need to look like in the future. Let me ask you this. Have you found any research around if you get rid of titles? Mm. Now, I'm a a full supporter of the idea that leadership is not a title by itself. Leadership Mm. is influence, right? There's a lot of people around us that are known as leaders, but they maybe aren't in a position of authority. And so Mm. leadership is separate. From, but but it does seem like inside organizations that people tend to look at authority to get approval on things. So how do you maintain the accountability if you take some of those titles away? What does that picture look like, the accountability side? I think it, it would look more like an orchestra or, or a sports team. It's... Uh, we all have roles in sports team, but the, the team is the one that wins. And, and there is not really much hierarchy in the orchestra. The same, you need somebody orchestrating. You need that. Otherwise, it's going to be chaos. But then everybody has somewhere to play and be free to, to express themselves on their competency. So I think uh, uh, people at the leadership top should be worried because people are looking at their role differently, but they have a role to play if they evolve into what we've been talking for the last half an hour into being those, those inspirationally visionary people who can let people shine and let people do their best at their work. I think that will make a lot of people who are quitting now their jobs, not quitting. If they're happy with their job, if they're respected at their jobs, that's what people want to get from work. It's not just the money. So I think that's where we need to tell leaders to mm-hmm. focus, create those spaces where people can bring their best and uh, hierarchy will not be there. The roles will be a bit different, but right, the people still need somebody to guide them and that's not going to disappear, never. Okay, so that's not going to disappear. All right. You just triggered another thought and it's for the li- <laughs> it's, it's just for the listener's sake. If you are not fulfilled at your job, is it possible that you've become 
good at your job, proficient at your job, that you've lost that sense of growth. And so I think the focus of the book is for leaders that if they have people that are feeling like they're not getting growth or they feel like they've hit kind of a a brick wall or a ceiling or whatever, put them on a new project where they can get excited about it. Exactly. Exactly. You think so? Yeah. Yeah, no. And when people tell me what happens with millennials, my millennials are leaving. I said, well, because you put them in operations, they're so boring in six months, give them a project. They love it. A project every six months. Today, you do that in IT. Tomorrow, you do that in market. Millennials love it. There's no hierarchy. You can talk to whoever you want. You're learning all the time. The same for more senior people. If they get stuck, they go, give them a project. They tell them, bring the project that whatever you want, but will make us better or bring more revenue. And they love that. You have a different perspective to everything, to hierarchies, because you don't have. You need to learn how to engage people that don't report to you. You need to learn to communicate in a business way so that people understand what you're doing so it's it's a really nice way to to learn and to get engaged and motivated and re-energize so all the people that i quit in i would say give them a project i, I think half of them would stay right <laughs> i think so <laughs> i think because it gives a sense of autonomy it gives uh, a sense of growth a sense growth. of purpose um, exactly. uh, some collaboration with new people. I think there's some exactly. some value there, uh, and just doing it in an orderly way that you don't disrupt the existing business, right? So it has Absolutely. to be done uh, care yeah. has to be done carefully. But I think you're right, and I think as some of the leaders are probably listening to this, you're going, "Ooh, this feels like it's out of my comfort zone. This doesn't feel very <laughs> comfortable." Just to sort of uh, let. Right. There's people that are very hierarchy driven that yeah. see things in a linear fashion and you've got to get approval for this. You've got to do that instead of allowing people to be free around a specific vision or a scope of, of a project mm-hmm. where, hey, they can go ask questions of people of different departments without the person in the other department feeling threatened Absolutely. by someone asking you questions that we're, we're on a team that's constantly growing, evolving, getting better. So we want to create more cross conversations. We want to create inner, inner workings between departments and so forth as much as possible. But I tell you, there's going to be some leaders that are like, no, my system is working just fine. I'm doing fine. I don't want to disrupt it in any way. And so every leader has to figure out to what degree do they set up some of these projects and so forth to get at least a group of people to start looking toward the future is what I'm exactly. hearing. Right. No, exactly. I think they, you got it, TJ. If they have questions, they should call you because no, no, are- they should read your book because <laughs> you, read the book. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. T- totally. Because <laughs> you have, you nail down so much information. It's like you turned over every stone of anything that you can could consider. And you included a lot of stories in there of your experience of working with leaders and teams and so forth and how things worked and how things didn't. I think you did a great job with the book. Anyway. Thank you. Thank you, TJ. Really, really appreciate. I know you, what you're telling me resonates so much. So I I'm glad wow. to meet people like you who can spread the word. It's not for us. It's we just want to help people Love to that. cope with the, the new reality, the, the opportunities. There's lots of opportunities. So I think we are completely aligning the thinking and the tools. And, and I'm glad you read my book. I'm, totally. I'm glad HBR bought the idea. It's not easy. They don't publish around project management very much. I think it was like eight years or seven years ago. Oh, really? So okay. I'm glad that they bought about the idea and say, well, now this is something fundamental. Harvard Business Review, Project Management Handbook, How to Launch, Lead, and Sponsor Successful Projects. Antonio, good book. And very technical. Every leader should read it and consider some of the ideas in this book and apply them with some vision. Um, Get your people excited about projects that can help propel the company into the future. Antonio, it was great to have you on the Unleash Your Greatness Within podcast. Any last words, anything you'd like to share about anything that we've talked about? 
Well, just embrace this. I think that there's no doubt the future is about projects. Then apply any methodology, but embrace that. This is a great opportunity. I think in this podcast, TJ, we covered the essentials, the yes. why people need to go this way. So it couldn't be more clear. So just try it out. Please try it out. And I think you'll see the benefits. So thank you very much, TJ. It's an honor to be here. Really, really an honor to be uh, with you. And I really enjoy the conversation. Me too. Anyway, thank you for having, for being willing to come on the Unleash Your Greatness Within podcast. It was great. Thank you. Thank you.